Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on our foundation level sample questions discussion. And we are looking forward to get started with our very first chapter, which is fundamentals of testing. And we'll be picking up some questions from this particular chapter from the set A of our syllabus. And uh, these are all the mock papers which are actually available on istqb.org. But the agenda here is to give you the explanation for each of the right answer and moreover the tips and tricks to tackle the question. So three papers which we'll be talking here will certainly be adding a lot of value to your understanding the, you know, the steps which is required to get the right answer and at the same time gaining that confidence which is required by any individual to mark the answers appropriately. Now, picking up the very first question of the chapter one, and the question is, which one of the following answers describe a test condition? Now, the first and foremost important thing, team, is when you look at a question in the examination, you start thinking what you know about it, okay? Before you look at the options, a lot of us get driven by the options and start looking at the option, like, let me see what exactly they are asking us, no. When you look at a question at the foundation level, it's really crucial for you and important for you to recall what do you know about this question and the term which they are asking you. These are very K1 level questions and you don't really have to be driven by the options because sometime for these K1 level questions, the options will be very tricky and you may get confused between them and land up picking up a wrong answer or come back to me and say that uh, most of the options were looking correct and I was confused because of that. The reason is you didn't concentrate on what you have learned. So I would recommend you strongly at this point of time, that is the K1 level questions, to recall your learning before you look at the options. The benefit of that approach is basically to reduce your effort required to judge if your answer is correct, right? So the very first thing here is let's talk about the test conditions. So generally test conditions are derived from the requirements, what you really have to test. And then the test conditions will be broken down into the test cases. So the chapter one certainly talks about these in detail that what is a test condition, what is a test basis, and what is a test case. So test cases are always derived from a test conditions, right? Now here they're asking you which one of the following answer describes a test condition, which clearly states that you're looking forward to the definition of the test condition. Now with having that defined, that test condition is something which is derived from the requirement and test cases are something which is derived from the test condition. Let's look at the options. Now option A says a distinguishing characteristic of a component or system. I think this is more about defining the feature or defining a component in the system. Now when you build a text box, you call it as a specific component and test condition is nothing to do with that, right? This is more on the functionality side, more on the feature side. B, a testable aspect of the component or system identified as a basis for testing. Yes, exactly. A testable aspect of a component or it can be for system. The test condition can be derived for anything which you test. It could be component testing, it could be integration testing, it could be system testing, it could be performance testing or any other level, right? So this is a testable aspect of anything identified as a basis of testing. Now this is a very good trick team, replace certain things with some other words to make your uh, answer more confidently true. C, the degree to which a software product provides functions which meet stated and applied needs when the software is used under specified conditions. Now that's a little tricky option, right? They just wanted to complex it so that you get confused and start thinking about different options related to it. Now this is more from an advanced level for your kind information, uh, which certainly deals with something called a suitability testing. The degree to which a software product provides functions which meet stated and implied needs when the software is used by a specific condition or under specified uh, conditions. So this is all covered in the advanced level, which is called as suitability. Now, how would you figure out that, that this is something not related to us? That is by making sure that you have a good understanding of the syllabus. That's where I keep strongly recommending people that go through the syllabus with my tutorials. It will add certainly a lot of value 
will increase your potential of recalling, understanding what you had on the syllabus and will tell you that, did I cover anything related to this? No, not at all. So that's none of my options. D, test cases designed to execute combination of conditions. I think the moment you talk about combination and foundation, first thing we should hit in your mind is decision table. That's where we tried several combinations of conditions, right? And chapter one or test condition is just to divert you with the word condition here so that you start thinking, oh yes, it is a combination of conditions and actions resulting from them. Now, basically a requirement is directly converted into a decision table and the decision table gives you the test cases. It's a technique. It's not a test condition at all. So this is where we decide the right answer is B, the testable aspect of component or system identified as a basis of testing. Now that became very simple, right? And probably, you know, I'm just explaining more to you, but once you understand this, you would hardly spend 30 seconds or maybe less to answer such questions. That's why a lot of people come back to me and tell me that, you know what, I finished the paper in 30 minutes and that was just a piece of cake for me, right? Because you know the content pretty well. You know the tips and tricks. So look forward to that. Let's take the second question from the same uh, sample paper or set A and from the chapter one. Which of the following statement is valid about objective of testing? Now, I think we remember these bullet points on the chapter one where we spoke about uh, the objectives of testing. And again, we should start listing them if you remember what you learned. We had, you know, finding defect as one of the common objective or major objective. Uh, providing necessary information for decision making, uh, preventing defects, right? And a lot many other things. I don't want to tell you everything because I want you to learn about it. So if you remember, you can relate it, right? So here we have to start defining the which one is which one among these are the objective assessing. So first again, start recalling what you remember and then look at the option. So option A says the test should start as late as possible. I think when you say preventing defect is one of the objective, we should start the testing as early as possible with help of static testing, right? Now, when you say static testing, of course, that begins much earlier in the life cycle and we don't have any concept. In fact, we have never learned the word that you should do late testing somewhere, right? Not throughout the entire syllabus at all. So that's something which can be ruled out as soon as you read half the option, but on a safety protocol, please make sure that you read the entire option. Sometime that can be turned around. So the test should start as late as possible so that the development had enough time to create a good product. Now the good products are created by quality and quality is measured by testing. So if development keeps spending a lot of time, no, you don't get a good quality product. It's more time spent by the tester on the system to get the quality product. B to validate whether the test objects work as expected by the user and other stakeholders. I think that's something more crucial for us to determine when talking about testing. I need to make sure at any point of time that we are validating the system, which meets the customer expectation from all the angles. Why are you testing? To meet the expectations. What's the principle of absence and fallacy? That if you just test a system, but it does not, it's not useful for the Customer, it's of no use, right? So from several points of view, justify yourself that are you surely sure that what you are picking up is right? That will give you confidence. C, to prove that all possible defects are identified. Principle number one, it says that at any point of time, you cannot say that there are no defects in the system. So not a good option for us to pick up. D, to prove that any remaining defects will not cause any failures. I'm not sure if we are so... Uh, you know, so smart enough to judge that if we have not known anything about a defect, can we make a decision that it will not harm the system or it will not cause any failures, right? So until unless you find a defect, you cannot make such statements. So again, does not apply to us. So the right answer here is B, to validate whether the test object works as expected by the users and the other stakeholders. Let's look at the third question here. Which of the following statement correctly describes the difference between testing and debugging? 
again, recalling your understanding on the testing and debugging, testing is just limited to execute the test cases and find the defects. But we do not deal with getting into the root cause. We do not get into the uh, debugging. That means fixing the issue and resolving it, right? So testing is limited to finding the defects, whereas debugging deals with many other activity that is like analyzing the issue, getting into the root cause and fixing the issue. By now, if you say that statement and recall it, you know what exactly is the answer. Anyways, the option A says, testing identifies the source of defect. Mm -mm, that's where you stop and say that, no, no, that's not correct. And even if you say something about good about debugging, that's not the answer anyways. So let's go to B. Dynamic testing shows failures caused by defects and debugging eliminates the defect, which are the sources of the failures. Looks good. C, testing does not remove faults, but debugging removes defects that cause the fault. For your kind information, defect and defaults are synonyms, so that's not a valid option at all. D, dynamic testing prevents the causes of failures. Mm -mm. Dynamic testing finds the defects, not removes the causes of failures, which is root cause analysis and fixing it. So what's the trick here? The trick here says that you are trying to pick up uh, the word testing and dynamic testing. So they know that if you remember the definition of testing and debugging, it will be simple enough for you to answer. So they tried tricking you with the word testing and dynamic testing. Now testing is generic term, okay, which can be broken down into static and dynamic. But the whole concept is both the things help you to only find the defects. Being a tester, if you are participating in static testing also, you only find the defects, but the authors of the documentation will remove the defect, right? So both the ways, if you pick it up, anyways, the answer goes exactly the same. So sometimes these tricks are used to you know, confuse you so that you get stuck, but I want you to be more confident with judging these options. So the right answer here is, B, dynamic testing shows failures caused by defects. Debugging eliminates the defects, which are the source of the failures by, of course, finding the root cause. A question number four, which one of these statements below describe the most common situation for a failure discovered during testing or in production? Now, these type of questions should bring your intention towards the end user. Saying that production, right? I'm not sure how many of you who are not working in testing right now really understand what is production, right? So we really want you to understand a few of the keywords of the corporate world so that you know what is a production environment where the real users work on it, okay? So production environment is an environment where real users interact with the system for in form of like alpha and beta. Now, here we are saying that what is that is something which is visible to a tester during testing. That means when he's practically interacting with the system, what is that can be observed. So if you see here, you have to behave like a user and pick the right answer. So A, the product crashed when the user selected an option in the dialog box. Looks perfectly matching to our expectation, but let's validate with the other options. Team, this is another good habit that even if you get the uh, relevant option right in the beginning, please, it takes another few seconds to read the other remaining options to be 100% sure that what you're picking up is accurate and correct. So B, the wrong version of compiled source code file was included in the build. Isn't it sounding like a root cause? And the root cause is not something which is visible to a tester, okay, as a failure. This is not a failure. This is more of like root cause analysis, which is telling you the reason behind the failure. So this is how you judge it, the difference between the failure or something which is visible to a tester and what is not visible to a tester. C, computation algorithm used the wrong input variables. Again, the root cause. D, the developer misinterpreted the requirement for the algorithm, which is, of course, again, a root cause, which is telling you why exactly you got the failure. But if you look at the option A, the product crashed when the user selected an option in the dialog box, which is exactly a user interpretation, which you do on the system while testing it. 
So this is something which is visible to your tester. So the right answer here is A, the product crashed when the user selected an option in the dialog box. So keeping it short and simple, we'll be covering a lot of questions here one after the other. So for today, we'll just stop here and look forward to the next tutorial to continue with the remaining questions of the chapter one. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.